Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Let's uh, get started. So just to, uh, just to remind you that we have, uh, this morning we will have uh, uh, reports from all the discussion groups from l last afternoon, wrapped up this morning, um, from all the four, four groups. And then we have the summary, summary of all the points from the conference by uh, Daniel uh, Wyckoff. And then uh, Didier and I will do will will do overall wrap up of the of the conference and logistics. So we'll start with the first uh, discussion group, and I'd like to in introduce uh, uh, Holger Schunemann. Uh, so Holger is uh, a professor and chair in the Department of Health uh, Research Method evi uh, Methods Evidence and Impact uh, at uh, McMaster uh, University. Uh, uh, he also is professor of uh, medicine and um, uh, Michael Gann chair in healthcare research. He also is an editor in chief in BMC of the, of the BMC Health and Quality of Life uh, Outcomes uh, Journal. Uh, Holger has done uh, a lot of work on the uh, grade uh, guidances uh, that uh, the group has produced uh, over the last 17 years, and uh, his research interests uh, are guideline uh, development, systematic reviews. Uh, healthcare related quality of life, uh, pulmonary function and respiratory disease epidemiology and knowledge translation. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm working at McMaster University, which is uh, widely known as the um, birthplace of evidence-based medicine. Um, and I'm always here to make um, advertisement for that um, particular institution. Um, that's my role as chair. Anyways, um, um, that's not really um, um, all that I'm going to speak about. So uh, first of all, thanks go to um, um, Paul Wally and um, Danielle um, Whitkoff for being the rapporteurs of our session. And, our, and thanks for um, um, my thank you also goes to the participants of the groups. I think we had a really, really productive um, um, four plus one. I think it's five, about five hours. Um, um, and um, um, we believe that we um, really made a lot of progress with regards to um, um, the questions that we were asked. The questions that we were asked to address, um, based on the intro that um, Chris um, Thayer yesterday, who I also should um, thank, um, um, based on the session that Chris um, Thayer was responsible for yesterday, were the following. So um, she introduced GRADE, and one of the main questions that we were supposed to address was, um, is GRADE sufficient? And I'll go back through there's some signaling questions um, very um, quickly. So are the great certainty of evidence domains um, considering um, all factors that determine certainty in the presence of a hazard, um, an association or an effect? Um, does it satisfactorily address um, how different streams influence the integration and development of conclusions? Um, if not, how do we preserve evidence-based principles in a rich integration process? How do you best combine integrate evidence streams for hazard identification? Um, what, which um, are the um, are there component are the uh, are there other components that um, could or should be included in the evidence integration process, and how are the um, ratings for certainty integrated with the findings to develop um, systemize some um, uh, um, systematized conclusions, and how can the ratings be used to evaluate contradictory data? So those were our four t four tasks. Um, it's um, probably pretty obvious that we were unable to address all of that. Um, so we um, picked, and um, um, before we actually um, went into the exercise and um, picked a few of the key challenges, we asked our group to do the following, um, and that is um, to put on their, um, the, the group members, to put on their science hats um, and take off their organizational or regulatory hats that they may be wearing in other circumstances. And we felt that was really important because our goal here was to develop um, optimal solutions for scientific concepts as opposed to working um, within um, some of the constraints that many of us are working, on, uh, working under um, 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 in our daily, daily life. Some of us were invited as scientists here and that's really what we tried to focus on, um, the science. So um, we thought that was pretty helpful. Um, I hope that the group members agree, and at the end of this presentation, um, we'll have group members um, 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 obviously adding um, um, to what we discussed, um, and hopefully they agree with that. So just as a, as a brief recap from what we, 
what we started out with. Um, um, based on these questions that we were supposed to address, um, GRADE is a framework that has been used for over 20 years. You know, it's led to um, um, hundreds of publications um, for many of us. Um, 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 we started with the GRADE framework, but we could have obviously started elsewhere because the concepts are similar. Um, it's just that in many instances the terminology differs. Um, GRADE is um, 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 one of the most accepted frameworks. It also overlaps with Bradford Hill and Bradford Hill's um, um, criteria for causation or um, considerations for ca causation were very much at the heart of the exercise that we actually went through. But um, we started our session with um, um, asking the group members whether or not um, these six overarching principles are widely accepted when we talk about assessing certainty, for instance, in a hazard or um, in a risk or in an association. Um, and these um, six principles were, um, as Chris presented them yesterday, other research, um, research studies well done and um, um, in you know, Cochrane, great terminology that would be we are looking at internal validity or risk of bias, EFSA terminology may be reliability and other groups will have different terminology whether or not the results are consistent across studies, which deals with the inconsistency domain that is um, common to many of the frameworks. How directly do the results relate to the actual question um, that also that deals with indirectness or relevance in EFSA terminology? Is the association precise or due to random error? Um, and I should have said, um, um, with regards to the inconsistency, what we're looking for is unexplained inconsistency, but is the association precise or due to random error that deals with imprecision and is in part covered by the reliability domain? Are these all of the studies that um, have been conducted and that largely deals with publication bias? We heard a, um, um, that being alluded to yesterday. And then um, um, the sixth um, um, bit broader criterion or domain is, is there anything else that makes us particularly certain, such as large associations, um, whether or not under the worst case scenario, the predictors still allow strong conclusions, and um, whether or not there are exposure effect or dose response relations. And um, as you can see, those of you who are familiar with Bradford Hill criteria, there's lots of overlap with Bradford Hill's criteria that were developed in the 1960s and um, have been very defining for the field. Um, once again, in, in EFSA terms, um, Chris also showed that yesterday, um, just to bring it back into the context, um, um, this is how you could look at that. Um, so reliability is um, largely addressing those issues, relevance is addressing those issues, and the uh, um, consistency is addressing inconsistency. So there is a lot of overlap between these different frameworks, and this is obviously from the EFSA um, um, manual. Okay, so um, we know um, um, based on many, many conversations over probably the, about the past decade that um, in the field of environmental health, um, um, there were three particular items and issues that seemed to not be well addressed in existing frameworks. And um, in order to make our task doable with the time that we had available, um, we identified once again these um, um, three um, 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 elements um, that I'm going to um, um, explain in some more detail. We identified these um, three elements to discuss with the group. And um, they, those elements were biological plausibility, as some, um, 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 and I'll explain that later, as a independent element that influences your certainty or our certainty that um, 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 a hazard is um, truly a hazard. We thought that we should be dealing more with um, consistency across different evidence streams based on what we were tasked with. And then um, the third issue that, came, that comes up repeatedly in um, exposure assessment, we believe, is um, um, our issues around study sensitivity. And um, 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 we look for definitions of how study sensitivity is actually defined. Um, we didn't find very much, to be quite um, frank. 
um, in existing handbooks for structured frameworks. Um, um, so just as an example from the IRIS handbook, and um, Chris um, volunteered for me to present this here or say this, the um, IRIS handbook um, um, defines some sensitivity or informativeness of the study as the ability of the study to detect the potential effect in question. So our group, um, we thought um, if we accomplish um, clarification around these um, three important concepts, we would do actually a lot. So um, um, we tasked the group with um, discussing how to improve the shared understanding of these concepts and operationalize the elements as, um, once again, by reviewing existing uh, um, frameworks, this has not been done previously. We worked in small groups, three to four people within our, within our um, 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 small group. Um, so these were the small, small groups. Um, um, each of the group discussed, um, tried to discuss each of these um, concepts, but um, what we made sure is that at least each, um, um, each of the concepts was addressed by at least one group. Um, and then that was followed by a larger group discussion. Um, so as I said, each group conceptualized the elements and provided criteria to operationalize them because these criteria for operationalization have not been, um, are simply not there or not in sufficient detail. And others um, then in the group challenged um, the small groups when they presented back. And once again, that was followed by a large group discussion. Okay, so we started with biological plausibility. Um, and um, we just looked at a few definitions to start the group off. Um, so Wikipedia as a very well um, known and reliable source was used, um, but obviously we used other ones. So biological plausibility is one component of a method of reasoning that can establish a cause and effect relationship between a biological factor and a particular disease or adverse event. Um, and then in the EFSA weight of evidence document, um, biological plausibility um, was defined as usually referring to the consistency between data and biological theory or mechanism. Um, so once again, just to make that very clear, what we tasked the group to do, because we felt that these are things that are, that are still, um, um, that are not well defined, they're looming in the background when we talk um, um, about structured evidence assessment framework. So we asked for better definitions and criteria to evaluate and operationalize. And this is essentially after a lot of discussion, most of our discussion focused on biological plausibility. Um, this is essentially what came out of um, our discussion. The first is that biological plausibility is not a separate domain that we would evaluate to express our certainty in an effect or in an association. And the reason is as follows. First of all, biological plausibility informs what types of questions we are asking. Um, Rudolf brought up a great example, he said, there are studies showing that high heels are, um, 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 wearing high heels um, is associated with breast cancer in women. Obviously, um, it is not very sensible to ask that particular question for an exposure assessment. Um, you would want to focus on the real exposure. So biological plausibility, for instance, whatever high heels are associated with, um, and their association and its associations with breast cancer is what you would want to focus on. So biological plausibility informs how we formulate questions. And um, what came out of the discussion was that, bio, that our judgment about biological plausibility is informed by already existing domains. So for instance, um, we would want to know about a mechanism and we would want to explore studies that explore mechanisms between an exposure and an outcome to make judgments about whether or not that mechanism is relevant for human questions. So in other words, the, um, um, the domain directness, relevance, or applicability to humans covers part of our judgment about biological plausibility. There were other domains in the already existing certainty evaluation or um, certainty domains that inform biological plausibility, such as consistency, strong association, and how well the studies were done. So for instance, a temporal relationship um, can only be shown through adequate study design, which has to do with, um, um, once again, study um, um, execution and limitations or risk of bias. And then finally, um, as a result of that um, very rich conversation with um, going through examples, um, um, one way 
um, for us to conceptualize biological plausibility, because obviously that is a relevant question that is asked, is if at the end of your, of your use of a structured framework to assess the certainty in an association, um, you express high certainty by looking at these individual domains, that means that biological plausibility is very likely. But biological plausibility, at least by our group, um, and really dealing with this concept that has been around for 50 or 60 years, was made up by one person, um, really biological plausibility is a result of an assessment of individual domains. And um, that is quite, obviously, um, that um, challenges the dogma, but um, that is one of the reasons for why we are here. We're not saying that biological plausibility is a concept that is not relevant. What we're saying is that biological plausibility is a result of a detailed and structured um, um, process to assess um, um, evidence. Okay, so that's um, one of the fundamental findings, and I'm sure that, lead, that will lead to um, um, lots of discussions. The next item that we dealt with was um, consistency across a body of evidence or evidence streams, and um, we um, defined, um, um, we provided definitions. So Bradford Hill, in this very old work, um, um, provided, for instance, the following definitions. Consistent findings observed by different persons in different places with different samples strengthened the likelihood of an effect. Um, and coherence, which relates to is between epidemiologic and, um, epidemiological and laboratory findings increased the likelihood of an effect. Um, Hill also noted that um, um, lack of such laboratory evidence cannot nullify the epidemiologic effect on, this, uh, on the associations. So um, um, one of our subgroups dealt um, with that particular um, um, issue and, and um, first of all um, looked at how we really are looking at this, um, 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 how we would define consistency in the context of uh, um, environmental hazard um, um, evaluation. Um, consistency is defined by similar pattern of response to an agent across some api and animal evidence, different species, different studies within species, different methods, including mathemo mathematical modeling um, um, that measure the same outcome. Um, the criteria that we would be looking for is, once again, can consistency be explained? Uh, sorry, can unex um, um, inconsistency be explained um, qualitatively or quantitatively? Um, can the results be repeated, which is um, the, um, um, the EFSA terminology, and um, um, there are specific, there are domains when you have quantitative estimates, when you can do a, a meta-analysis that will help you make judgments about consistency. And um, that discussion was pretty straightforward for us, um, um, and we felt that um, um, that um, overarching inconsistency or consistency domain is already well covered um, in the frameworks. Um, and um, what is required is better operationalization of um, how um, consistency across different species, including challenging um, current thinking about species, um, um, may help with um, integrating across these different lines of evidence. I keep that short. The third question um, re um, related to study sensitivity, and I already provided you with one of the, um, um, one of the definitions, um, study sensitivity basically referring to the ability of the study to detect the potential effect in question. And um, 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 in the EFSA handbook, um, sensitivity, I believe, is only mentioned under those in this particular bullet point, but um, 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 I'm ready to stand corrected. Criteria referring to the quality of studies or data, risk of bias, imprecision, and sensitivity are all factors affecting the reliability of piece of evidence in itself. The challenge is that sensitivity, and in particular how you evaluate sensitivity in existing instruments, has not been very well defined. And once again, um, this is, I think, why we are reporting back to the large group, because we are ready to be challenged, and you should um, bring your knowledge to the table. But anyways, we, um, our conversation around that was relatively short. Um, the definition, essentially, that the, that the group um, um, provided was that we are talking about detectability of the effect at the concentration of concern, in other words, at the exposure of concern, exposure, once again, being a very broad term. Um, and what was actually said, um, and the group largely agreed with, was, was that if a study is reliable and relevant, in other words, whether or not, um, if it's um, at low risk of bias and um, fulfills other domains, and is direct enough for the question, then um, it should be sensitive. And the um, evaluation of sensitivity under those two existing domains um, um, contributes to biological plausibility. 
which is consistent with what we said about biological plausibility. So in other words, study sensitivity um, um, would relate to, th to um, um, risk of bias and um, directness or reliability and relevance in EFSA terminology um, and would once again require further um, um, development of signaling questions. So these elements um, um, appear to be ex um, included in existing um, great domains and um, probably other frameworks. Um, 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 what is required is a better definition, operationalization, how it's being as, um, assessed or addressed. So for instance, at the end of your structured, of your application of a structured framework to evaluate a hazard, you may say that based on um, these individual domains, once again, biological plausibility is likely. Um, we also thought that, as I said, consistency between and across species is addressed already and sensitivity is as well. We approached these questions, we believe, um, with a very open mind um, and, um, as I said, had a very rich discussion around them um, and um, um, hope that um, we will provide useful output for others, at least um, um, based on our impression, there is not a lot in this particular area. Um, um, so after input from this group, we are planning as next steps, which is one of the things that we were asked to talk about, um, to produce a scientific article that will describe the work of that um, particular subgroup, including the preparatory work, and um, that that um, um, either should be based on or should then be further evaluated um, on the basis of case examples. That's what we had to report back on. Great. Thank you. Great progress, actually. So uh, we'll open for a few questions, discussion, discussion points. Please. So you were talking about uh, the definition of a sensitive uh, study. <coughs> um, I think you would need to add <coughs> uh, a study that is uh, able to detect the potential effect that is believed to be large enough to be relevant. And Lock, okay. And if we do that, then, and we think about the non, uh, about, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> about genotoxic carcinogens, then a relevant effect is something like one in a million. So what does a study look like that is uh, sensitive enough to detect an effect size of one in a million? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so, um, um, uh, I would just say, so we take this up as a point. Um, um, I hope Danielle, where's Danielle? Um, there is Danielle, she's taking notes. So um, if I understand your point correctly, um, um, is, um, there, there, there needs to be a consideration um, at the point of, um, or at the time point when you evaluate studies that allows you to um, detect the relevant effect um, and that relevance um, may be very subjective um, on the basis of um, what you consider to be a relevant effect. And if your interest, if the one in a million, um, public health is often concerned with one in a million, um, um, just to be just to be clear, um, or even clinical questions are concerned with one in a million, I can give you a few examples. If that's your, your question of interest or your effect of interest, then those are the type of studies that you would be looking for. Hopefully, people are reasonable and don't, um, 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 are not that interested in effects in one in a million, um, and then that would not be part of your, set of your um, 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 uh, um, question formulation. But um, good point, so we'll take that up. And Chris, you want to respond to that as well? And others from the group, um, please feel free to speak up. Also, and, and our focus is really more on the hazard characterization part. So sort of prior to sort of the quantitation of the relationship well, in terms of the discussion. Not saying that the point isn't relevant, but just sort of that's where the discussion. Yeah, but I don't see it. why has it identification has anything to do with it. I'm just saying, well, you want to detect a relevant effect, and it depends on what you find relevant. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, um, in the public health field, so who of you is wearing, the many of you are big travelers, um, long distance travelers. Is there anybody in the room who wears stockings um, when you go on a long distance flight? Compression stockings? Okay, there is one person at least, there is at least one person in the room. The effects are in the one in a million or two in a million or ten in a million um, uh, range in terms of prevention of um, deep venous thrombosis. So you see that um, we are often addressing these type of effects um, in many areas of healthcare. They may be relevant or may not be relevant. In fact, at airports, you can buy compression stockings left and right. So, so all that I'm saying is it depends on what you're, I, I completely agree with you, it depends on what you're interested in, 
um, with regards to um, um, uh, uh, with regards to how you would design your clinical question. And I refer to average risk people, obviously not high risk people for um, um, blood clots in their legs. Other. Yes, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. May I ask you a question which is a little bit at the border of science and communication? Because uh, we have discussed a lot uh, about reproducibility crisis uh, recently. And I guess a simple question would be whether GREAT is equipped to, yeah, to provide direction uh, to, the, to the concerned public, so to speak. Uh, by looking at the tip of the iceberg of studies, uh, I think GREAT can do a good job in qualifying the evidence. But uh, the concern is, I think, not only to detect uh, the strengths of, of evidence and the flaws and publication bias and so on, but also to react on uh, distortions of the body of evidence, which results from all those design flaws and flaws of the scientific process or procedures or scientific community, how, it, how things are, are done by looking at what is available. So the gut feeling is sometimes it's more uh, concern is what, uh, what about uh, those evidence which is not available, and obviously GREAT cannot deal with it, but is it possible to detect anything um, that can be informative to react to the reprodu yeah. reproducibility so, issue? Yeah, no, so I would, I would um, um, so that's a good question. Um, I think uh, it requires an answer in the context of structured frameworks. Um, so first of all, I think part of, of the problem that you're raising is a problem of, of uh, not a problem, but it relates to systematic review methodology. And GRADE is not necessarily defining, it provides help with this systematic reviews, but it's not defining systematic review methodology. GRADE fundamentally um, uh, um, operates under the principles that a good systematic review is the basis of decision making. But um, having said that, um, um, so, so a lot of the a lot of your evaluations of studies are a result of how you define your systematic review protocol. If you are only interested in low risk of bias studies, then um, that's part of your protocol. But having said that, um, so GRADE is not only the structured framework for evaluating the certainty. GRADE, the second part of GRADE relates to um, um, making decisions. So GRADE has produced over the past ten years or so evidence to decision frameworks that um, um, evaluate criteria beyond just the certainty of the evidence in an effect um, that help you make decisions or formulate recommendations. And that particular, um, um, these particular frameworks have a, very, uh, have a very specific section that deals with research priorities, which is what um, I think you are relating to. And the research priorities directly, directly follow from that evaluation of the evidence. And um, um, so that is covered and it relates to issues around feasibility, um, um, acceptability, uh, values and preferences, equity, um, and other types of considerations that are relevant in evidence to decision or in um, uh, multi-criteria decision making. So that is, that is there and, and um, in part, um, if we're just focusing on associations and effects, um, there is also direct translation that is part of the last Cochrane handbook, um, a table, um, direct translation of shortcomings of research into um, uh, research priorities that can be derived from that. One more question, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dick Sein, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled because if um, this sort of criterion applies to individual studies that have been performed already or the design of future studies, you may sort of miss the contribution of that particular study which, which has been done already to the overall picture. Is, 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 is my interpretation correct or, or do, you, do you envisage that the study can be reliable in a bigger picture while it may be a lousy study um, based on the, on the criteria that we apply to as, of, as of today? Yeah, um, if I understand your point correctly, um, the the evaluation of, of study sensitivity, you're referring to sensitivity, right? Um, the evaluation of sen study sensitivity will be informed by the type of question, so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg um, kind of situation. It will be informed by the question that you are asking. If your question, based on whatever realistic exposures are, um, uh, um, is about broad ranges of exposures, 
So very high exposure versus very low exposure, and the studies that you're, that, that um, 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 studies may only look at one level of exposure, then based on your systematic review protocol, you may say this is not a relevant question, uh, study for that particular question, and it may not be included in your assessment. If you are just looking across, um, for an exposure um, effect relation um, and you're willing to synthesize across different studies, your inclusion criteria may be broad and you may take this particular study as one data point and accept it as an indirect comparison against other studies. So I think the answer to this question is very much based on um, the question that you're interested in and what you're willing to accept. Ideally, you would only accept internal controls, in other words, high and low con exposures. If the evidence base is so poor, you might um, accept external controls or external comparisons, that is, comparisons with other studies. Um, but that is very much defined on the basis of your protocol. So we are not saying that you would throw this out. We would say that study sensitivity needs to be evaluated on the basis of the individual question that you're, that you're, that you're asking. So a study may not be sensitive for a certain question, but it may be included in a review if there is a dearth of evidence that, com that has internal controls across different ranges of exposures. That's, I don't know if people from my group would want to add to that, but that's consistent with the, with the definition, I think. No, there doesn't seem to be disagreement from the members of my group, which is pretty good. Um, it was a very, constructive group. Mm -hmm. We started a little late, but I think we are almost, uh, are we? Yeah, one, one more question or comment? Please, Sebastian. Uh, Holger, the, the study sensitivity isn't that, in my mind at least, it's closely linked to precision and imprecision, or is that completely different concept? Because you want to detect an effect and then you ha your, your study has to be powerful enough to do that. Um, it, it, it probably is, um, so if you wouldn't be able to detect an effect if the exposure range was not broad enough, right? If that's what you're interested in. So um, I think, so my interpretation is that, um, so first of all, one thing that we recognize is that these domains are rarely completely independent, right? They all relate to each other and one assessment will influence an assessment on another domain. So but with this particular, um, for this particular question, um, um, I, would, I would think that precision is probably unrelated to that. Um, um, what we are dealing with here is, uh, um, um, are, is, there, is there enough exposure, um, is, there, is the, the range of exposure broad enough to detect an effect? And um, um, obviously, if you have one exposed person, um, which relates to precision, then you cannot make that evaluation. But um, if you have sufficient, so, so um, if you have a sufficient number of people exposed across a different range um, of exposures, then you could make that assessment. So it's indirectly related to precision, but it's not related to the precision of the estimate, I think. Um, at the end, obviously your certainty in the association is influenced by how many people were exposed in the individual groups. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks thank you much. so much for the and the, and the whole group. Okay, thank you very much. Let's keep on our science hat and move on to uh, the second breakout session. Uh, <laughs> Sofia Diaz will report on this. Sofia Diaz studied probability and statistics at the University of Lisbon and uh, did a PhD on the predictive comparisons at the University of Sheffield. She worked uh, from 2004 to 2007 at the University of Manchester and um, a more, uh, was statistician for the Cochrane Menstrual Disorder and Superfertility Group until 2014. Uh, she is currently the director of the NICE Clinical Guidelines Technical Support Administration Board. Please, Sophia. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to contribute to this um, colloquium and thank you for everyone who participated in the group and in particular for the people who helped me uh, chair and put together the conclusions of the group. So we were discussing issues related to bias adjustment in meta-analysis um, and this was uh, very um, focused on the, the methods discussed in Julian's lecture and as the more recently 
uh, recommended methods. So the main topics that we did discuss were the benefits of considering a bias adjustment over just traditional meta-analytical approaches, and that includes assessment of risk of bias and grade. So this would be benefits of having this in addition to that uh, traditional assessment. And then we uh, compared the av available methods for bias adjustment, and we produced some tables that aim to highlight the main advantages and limitations and considerations uh, to take into account if you're considering using any of these methods. And what we found is that basically they are all very context specific, so it is hard to provide general advice. Uh, so some of the general points that we felt we could make was that bias adjustment meta to meta-analysis has benefits over a narrative summary or a grade assessment alone. Um, it is acceptable and desirable uh, to incorporate external evidence in meta-analysis. However, the type of external evidence that you would want to include would depend on the situation. So you could have empirically based prior distributions, you could have expert opinion or other types of external evidence could be used, but it would be very situation specific. The topic of using elicited expert opinion on bias raised very strong views in opposite directions. Some people were adamant that it um, is a good thing to do and some people were adamant it's not a good thing to do. But overall, we know that every uh, assessment of evidence requires subjective judgments anyway and this is a way of making it explicit, although it is subject to other problems. Um, another general point is that there is potentially a lack of sources of evidence to inform biases uh, across different disciplines, and there was no general objection to any particular method, so we felt that it was important to um, agree that no one wanted to rule out a method, well, that the group as a, as a whole didn't want to completely rule out or completely uh, support a particular method. So that's why we decided to tabulate the general issues with each method. Um, it has been suggested in other contexts that using only internal estimates of bias, so methods such as the triangulation that Julian mentioned would be preferable to using external evidence. The group as a whole didn't feel this was a particular issue, so it depends uh, was the, the general uh, answer to that. So whatever method is used, um, all the evidence integration teams should include expertise in evidence appraisal and as well as topic expertise. So these methods do require that these expertise are present, but then they should be present anyway. Um, so I'm just going to briefly show uh, what we did in terms of trying to compare the different methods. Um, obviously, the, we, we tried to put tables together that uh, for each of the five methods or we looked at had uh, looked at the methodological implications of, of the method, strengths, time and expertise required, which are often an important factor, whether the method needs to be tailored or not, and whether there's a requirement for extra data that wouldn't normally be available already. So uh, the quality effects model, which is a, a weighting um, type of method, has some advantages that it, it doesn't require any particular extra time or data. Uh, it would work even if you have only small number of studies included, but it does have some other limitations, particularly um, the fact that it requires a comprehensive tool for appraising the quality of your studies, which may not always um, be, sen uh, be in existence. A regression type approaches, so where you can regress uh, to your idealized study or the best possible study. Again, there are a lot of limitations and, and strengths. One of the strengths uh, I think is important to highlight is that it is a very informative method provided you have sufficient um, studies included to inform it properly. So it can be very useful, but you do need to have uh, quite a lot of evidence, which often is not the case. It does not require any additional external data, so that might also be uh, an advantage. Um, so this, I think I'll skip very briefly because it, it's very hard to define exactly what this method is and we had quite a lot of discussions even trying to uh, decide what exactly we mean by this, but it's basically incorporating standard approaches to correcting or adjusting for studies that you know have perhaps some limitations or, or flaws such as missing data and things like that. So I'll I'll skip over that a little bit. Um, using empirical priors to inform your bias. Um, so again, there are several strengths, limitations, and issues to consider um, along about time and expertise that might be required and not available. Um, one of the 
issues is that a lot of empirical data would be needed to estimate these bias priors. So you'd need to compare bias and unbiased studies across a uh, lot of uh, different disciplines and to decide what is the magnitude and potential uncertainty in the bias. So this would prove to be a large commitment that you would have to undertake this research, but once you've done that for a particular area, you can then reuse these priors in the future. So at the moment, that data is not available, but if it ever became available, then you can use it. So after the initial effort, not a lot more work would be required. Um, using expert opinion has prior. So as I said, this generated uh, some strong opinions against and in favor. Uh, but as part of the methodological limitations, there is the issue that people do have their own biases, which the methods for elicitation may not completely solve. One of the strengths is that because people are forced to um, make explicit judgments on the direction and, and magnitude of biases, this then becomes transparent. So it, it becomes very clear what people said uh, on the magnitude of direction and uncertainty in the bias. So one of the flaws is also potentially one of the strengths if you want to think about it like that. So it could be it could be a subject to some biases, but then it's e explicit and transparent. It's quite resource intensive, especially if you do have a lot of studies that need to be assessed individually by experts. But in terms of external data, you don't need to actually go and collect any data from external sources. Um, so those are some of the issues we considered. Um, so in terms of identifying, so we, some of these methods do require uh, evidence on sources of bias uh, and it was discussed whether this evidence exists or whether it could be potentially collected and it was thought that for some disciplines and specific problems within those disciplines there might already be this evidence but it would need to be systematically explored, collected and analysed. So a lot of these issues are very, very discipline and context specific, depends on the types of studies and the types of evidence that you will have. So in terms of things we discussed, if we were to systematically collect um, evidence on bias, who would collect it? How would they actually go about doing it? And sometimes it might not be possible to collect such evidence. It might just not exist. Um, also, it was felt that it was important to address or actually assess the relative impact of different bias domains. So for example, a domain such as blinding may be important in some circumstances but may not be so important in other circumstances. So for each type of study, each type of discipline, there may be different impact of different bias domains uh, in, the, in the outputs. Um, and there is also the potential for learning from studies that are already within the synthesis to define the magnitude of bias. So you might not actually need to go outside the studies you already have to get some evidence on the magnitude and the directions of the biases. Uh, so some of the possible solutions, so one of the, some of the issues identified, so we asked, well, why aren't these methods used or what would be the potential barriers for implementation of these types of methods? And it could be broadly described as three things, lack of data on the bias, lack of expertise on how to apply these methods and time constraints. So we don't really have proposed solution to the time constraints issue. I guess that is linked in a way to the availability of data and expertise. Uh, we also wanted to highlight that by adjusting for bias, you're, off, you're usually increasing the uncertainty so you get a more precise, uh, so you get a less precise but less biased result. And that needs to be made clear to people that they're going through all this effort collecting extra data potentially to get a less precise result but actually unbiased, ideally. Um, but some of the solutions that we proposed for Lack of uh, expertise, well, obviously workshops such as these, webinars, some online materials and um, other uh, ways of uh, addressing the expertise uh, of the, the people uh, potentially conducting these analyses. Uh, it was also felt that a consistent measurement of bias domains in the literature would help with identifying the data 
that would then inform us on the magnitude and directions of bias. Uh, as well, so, so a systematic analysis of association between bias features and effect size. So as I said, it might be felt that for some specific scenarios, some domains of uh, risk of bias are not really impacting on the effect sizes. Um, so in terms of future developments, it was felt that there is a need for guidance and, and some worked examples of meta-analyses uh, looking at different bias adjustment methods and how they would apply to the different disciplines. So because a lot of the strengths, limitations uh, we listed in those tables are very context specific, it was felt that if some worked examples were available, people could um, see uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each particular method. Um, it was also felt that it would be useful to understand what evidence on bias is already in existence. Uh, and perhaps if there isn't much of it, uh, we need to make sure it is collected. Uh, but if there is, we need to understand it. Um, also, it was felt again, it's very context and discipline specific what the most important bias domains are. So we felt it was hard to say you should always consider these and adjust for these types of bias because there isn't knowledge whether they are all equally uh, impactful on the effect size that you that you get. So we wanted to um, get a more better understanding of is there a systematic association of bias domains with the actual bias? Is it worth adjusting for? So if the effect is very, very small of the bias, then maybe there is no point in going through all this extra work. And is it even possible to identify the relevant bias domains for all the contexts that we may be working under? Uh, so um, it, well, I think it was really productive that all the discussions led us to identify lots and lots of problems. Uh, and the recommendations are quite general and mainly uh, reflecting the need to understand what the real problems are and the fact that they're very uh, discipline specific. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Any uh, comments from the group or outside? Holger? One of the benefits of these meetings is that we have an opportunity to clarify issues. So one of your first um, 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 slides related to, if you go back to your first slide, you said that um, bias-adjusted um, um, analysis is um, superior, has benefits over grade alone. Mm -hmm. um, in one of the subsequent slides, you said that there's a lack of data, expertise, and time, and methods to do this. I wouldn't say methods. I would say okay. data and expertise. Okay, data and expertise. Okay. so. So um, um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if you're familiar with um, Great's um, take on bias-adjusted meta-analysis. So Great does not preclude um, bias-adjusted analyses. So that, that first statement, I'm obviously wearing my Great hat, um, is, doesn't, is, can you explain what you mean by, by yes, that? Yes, so what we mean by this is in, in, in the relation of comparing this additional so assuming that at, at the moment bias adjustment meta-analysis are not being conducted in the field, which is, uh, they are not, but great is. So it is in addition, it's to in a comparing what you could do to what you're already doing at the moment. Okay, okay. so let me clarify, let me clarify that particular issue. So we just, so first of all, um, um, great does not preclude bias adjusted meta-analysis, right? If you yeah. provide us with the methods, we will be doing bias-adjusted meta-analysis. So that first statement is, is I, I'm, I'm just not clear what it is. And then, um, so would you, would you agree that loss to follow-up yeah. is a possible bias? Yeah, that's right. I mean, okay. this is, this is um, so this is in the context of comparing what is done at the moment okay. to what could be done in the future. So it's not a criticism of grade or of narrative summaries, that it's just at the moment, the way it's being implemented, you could go further uh, to get a, a bias-adjusted estimate. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the, on the spot here, but, but there, is, there is guidance, there is guidance from GRADE for how to deal with loss to follow-up and um, adjust um, um, for yeah. loss to follow-up. Just as, a, as one example, so as I said, this is a good opportunity to clarify mis misconceptions. There's a recent paper um, that deals explicitly with um, 
um, how to um, deal with loss to follow up as a risk of bias criterion and um, possibly adjust for, um, um, for loss to follow up. So, so it's probably helpful to put this into context, look a little bit at the literature. There's another paper that deals with um, 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 expressing that when these methods are available, then bias adjusted um, um, analyses um, should be part of grades. So just for clarification. Yeah. So this, uh, yeah, that's right. So we could clarify this point further by saying that what we mean by this is that you should go further and try to adjust your results if, if you can. Uh, and this would be over and above just reporting that there was low quality evidence and not dealing with it. So that is what is meant. So this was in the context of exploring the benefits over traditional meta-analytical approaches. So that is probably, uh, yeah, we'd need to put it into the, that context. So it was, at the moment, grade is being applied, but it, bias adjustment isn't. But not to say that it, it's not allowed by grade. That's not what we meant. It's just we should go further. That's, yeah. Does anyone, sorry, does anyone from the group want to clarify that a bit further? Um. So it's, it's just, a, it, it is internally inconsistent because you can, risk of bias is only one criteria, right? You That's can still have low certainty after you adjust for risk of bias because of inconsistency or indirect. Well, we're not saying that this should replace the grade, if that's what you mean. We should, it, it's just going that extra step. I don't see what the problem is. Okay, okay. so, so um, um, no, I heard you say that, that it's not enough to say there's low certainty. You can have a bias-adjusted meta-analysis, risk of bias-adjusted meta-analysis, okay, and do that in the context, and you could say, under those circumstances, there is low risk of bias because you adjusted for it. But in addition to that, you may still have low certainty in that body of evidence That's for right. other reasons. That's right. And okay. in fact, we just said adjusting for bias usually leads to less certainty. Okay. That is a fact, yeah. I agree with that. Okay. So, yeah. clarify. There was another question. Okay. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I'm not familiar in this field, but I, I was struck by your last bullet here on, on this slide. Yeah. And the uh, remarks further on that there was not much time needed for certain methods, and later on you need much more guidance and, and workshops and so on. So it's my question is how you deal with um, opposite um, opinions from from experts. Is that somehow included in the in the methodology and? Do you really think that there's not mo more time needed? Because I think oh, uh, when you yeah. discuss, um, when you have different opinions, you need more time to for discussion. Yeah, right? so I think one in the elicited expert opinion, that was one of the, I didn't go through every single advantage and disadvantage, but this is one of the methods that does require extra time. It is time consuming. Uh, if you want to use elicited expert opinion on the bias parameters. So that's definitely a factor. It does require more time, especially if you have a lot of studies. On the issue of the strong views, uh, it probably isn't clear uh, here, but what, what we mean by that is that in the group, some people felt this should never be used, and some people felt actually it's, it's fine, it's actually quite a good method to use. So the idea of using expert opinions on the magnitude, direction, and uncertainty in the bias um, that's what I, I mean by this point. And yes, it does require quite a considerable resources in terms of time and expertise of the group. In terms of the opposing views that I think you were referring to, so what if you have five experts and some say there is no bias, some say there's lots of it. So there are methods to, there are different methods you could use to either average over them or uh, use different consensus uh, methods and so on. Well, I think it's also important to, to uh, sort of uh, design how you put the experts together. Oh yeah, definitely. So th we didn't go into that level okay. of detail. We're just thinking of, there are methods for elicitation of evidence from, uh, of information from experts. And we would assume the appropriate one is being used, but we didn't go into that there, yeah. Thank you. We still have time for some. I have a question. So, uh, given what you presented yesterday and what you learned now during the breakout session, would it be possible to make some kind of a decision tree on what kind of method you would use to 
Yeah, so that uh, that's a really good point. And we we want well, ideally we would have wanted to go if if you have this, then do that. If you have that, then do this. But and that was sort of the motivation for doing these kinds of tables. That the aim wasn't to say this method is great and this method isn't great. It was to say you if you want to use this, for example, in a regression, you have to consider these points. Do you have enough studies? Do you have enough time? Do you have enough data? All these. So we, we thought that would help us go to the next step, which would possibly also be helped by considering some case studies that have different scenarios. And you could then say, well, if you have this type of observational evidence and different species and that sort of thing, you, sh you can't use this, but you could use that. And that would help because it was felt that a lot of the options are very, very context specific. And some might be completely impossible to do in some contexts, but really, really useful in others. So I think these tables were meant as um, a first step into the issues to consider and then you can begin to think, does it apply to my particular scenario? Um, I think that's a fair reflection. Does anyone want to contradict that? Yeah. Actually, I have a short follow-up question too. Uh, could you bring an example of, uh, of using this, this method in the context of different species, for example? Well, um, it would ha it would I guess it would depend on the model that you have to link the things and where th and so I think these methods apply more to what you think of the specific studies. Uh, so, uh, if you have some animal studies that you felt were at no risk of bias, then maybe you wouldn't need to adjust. But if you have some human studies that have flaws in them, then you'd adjust those. And how you link the two things would also. Matter. So you basically have to, so there's no defined methodology for doing this, or is there? Do, yeah, I'm doing what, the combination the, of the evidence? Doing the regression, yeah, and uh, correlation with the uh, regress towards the ideal study. Uh, yeah. I'm just asking for, uh, for an example of something that's... Yeah, that's right. So one of the, of the problems with applying this method would be how do you define your ideal study? I think that is... Um, mentioned somewhere there, it should be anyway, um, requires a, def a definition of the ideal study, which in some circumstances might be quite problematic. Ideal, uh, ideal in terms of no bias? Uh, yes, so the study that you can find a covariate that if you regress on it, you, your aim would be if that covariate is say zero, you'd have your perfect study. But in some contexts like that one, I would imagine it's quite difficult to define. I think Julian wanted to say something. Um, just comments on the kind of human animal kind of issue. The, the, the methods we were talking about and that I was talking about were about internal validity, um, whether you get the result, right result for whatever animal you're looking at. Um, and that re there, there are two broad approaches. One, either you've got lots of studies of the same sort of thing and you can do things across studies, or you take each individual study and try and fix that. Um, so they don't help at all in the animal versus human consideration. But the idea of putting a prior on the bias term um, has been discussed and extends to putting a prior on a relevance term about the different effects one might expect to see in different species. Now, that is very, very subjective, of course, but uh, methodology would translate to that question, even though that's not a question about internal biases, about what we might call external bias or, or directness of evidence. Thank you. Ah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is just a comment uh, some th about something we didn't discuss, and it's, I think it would be quite useful in the future. I mean, it's a bit early now, but to have some kind of guidance on how to check whether a bias-adjusted meta-analysis is fit for purpose. So, for example, with a systematic review, we've got guidance on whether it's been done properly, um, but we don't currently have that for a, for, for a risk of bias adjustment. And... Um, it could be important because obviously there's quite a lot of wiggle room in statistical analysis for getting things, you know, how the, you know, from manipulating your result, uh, how you choose priors and so on. So it might be useful to think, uh, you know, about how, you know, what are the features of bias-adjusted meta-analysis that we should look for um, as being good practice. I don't know if anyone has any comment on that. Okay, 
so I think the methods as standalone things have been defined and they have their validity, but obviously there's quite a lot of options and subjectivity into exactly what you choose as your data, your evidence and so on. So yeah, that would be interesting. Thank you very Thank much, you. Sophia. Thank you. So uh, we're going to discussion group uh, three, and uh, Professor Rubin is uh, going to summarize the, the discussion. We'll open it for the, for the questions and comments. Uh, I think it, it's important that I begin that, that saying I'm sort of an odd choice to be uh, chair of the session uh, since there's, uh, I'm, I'm probably one of the most ignorant people here about the general topic. Uh, and in my, my background uh, as a kid, I was in, 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 in physics and I did a little psychology and economics and education law and some, and some medical things, mainly in, in the context of consulting projects. But I have absolutely no experience in toxicology uh, or regulatory issues, very little, maybe in the, in the context of, of making presentations for the US uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration. But uh, you know, nothing about toxicology in, in particular. Uh, and so, in fact, I, uh, I didn't even know what many of the acronyms meant until actually uh, yesterday or today. So I'd never heard of GRADE before. Which is, which is the topic I didn't even know. What, what does it stand for? Is it a G R A D E? Stands for Holger. <laughs> so no one knows. That, okay, that makes me feel more comfortable. It stands for grading, grading recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation. And it's an acronym um, that was um, um, developed about 17 years ago. Um, over 30,000 citations to its work. If that means something. So, um, yeah. That just emphasizes my ignorance. And so I'm, I'm at least, I'm almost two decades out of date on, on There's that. There's one person is, who is more ignorant in this room, and that's me. Make me eminently qualified. Um, so in fact, when, during this, uh, the sessions that, that, that we had, as, uh, as, as chair, I, I mainly listened and tried to, uh, tried to learn and tried to make comments about the topics that I thought I could uh, contribute. And 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 the and the t and the, those topics are, are mainly things that that come from uh, the field of statistics, maybe something from computer science or some of these other application areas that I thought might be useful in in the context of the kind of toxicology studies that that I was I was, I was hearing. And at um, at the end of of this presentation, which Laura will, uh, presented will, uh, developed, and I hope you'll do the presentation. I'll come back in at the end. We, we get to the to the topics that I thought might be useful in this other area, and and the, the contributions that I suggest at at the end of this are just ideas, things that I think are are useful in other areas, and that seem to me to be possibly related to the kinds of studies that that you guys do, <coughs> but you've got to be the judge of whether any of these I, ideas are actually useful. Uh, I think that that they probably are at the end, but I certainly don't know enough about these main points. Uh, to to uh, lead a discussion on it. So, Laura, if you wouldn't mind, would you come forward? Great. Okay, if you... Okay, go there. I'm happy to sit back now. And when, they, when we get to why points, I'll be glad to So first of all, I have to apologize since we, uh, we have not even used uh, the template <laughs> that we were supposed to use. And uh, I have to admit that uh, we have also <clears throat> somehow deviated a bit from uh, which was the task uh, given to our group because uh, uh, the task was to discuss uh, about quantitative methods to integrate evidence uh, across. The screen, Pardon? Ah, yes. So since we had not 
concrete uh, uh, method at hand to discuss uh, and to evaluate for the strength, limitations and applicability. I had to say that we focus mainly on what are uh, currently the uh, challenges, the difficulties that we face in hazard ident identification when combining, uh, uh, integrating evidence. And uh, then we try to come up with some proposals uh, and uh, uh, contribution from Donald was uh, useful because uh, as he explained, he's somehow an outsider. So uh, he put on the table some ideas that uh, could be considered for the future. So first of all, uh, we had also discussion at the beginning related to the concept of hazard, so the focus uh, of our discussion should be hazard identification. I had to say that we went uh, also a bit beyond this uh, and uh, because uh, we, there was the feeling that uh, separation uh, with hazard characterization, those responses not so clear cut. And uh, uh, overall, that was uh, clearly uh, an agreement on the fact that uh, using quantitative approaches is a value because uh, it makes uh, uh, more objective, more transparent uh, the combination, the integration uh, of the various sources. And uh, I had to say that we discussed quite a lot what we mean by quantification, what we really quantify in the hazard identification. And the conclusion from the group was that uh, um, what we quantify is somehow the contribution of the various uh, sources uh, of evidence in light of the relevance, the validity, uh, the limitation that could be in the evidence. Uh, and also, uh, the, somehow we quantify, it is important to quantify how much e, uh, each source of evidence can contribute. Uh, uh, and there was a mention of the Bayesian network uh, that could be a way uh, for doing so, uh, because this could also, this can lead uh, uh, for the future to uh, research, but also to indication uh, to the risk managers on areas on which uh, it is important to focus. And uh, also, uh, fundamentally, we want to express uh, quantitatively what is the confidence and the certainty in the conclusion about the, the hazard. And then we discuss quite a lot what are the sources uh, of uh, uh, heterogeneity that uh, we are confronted with. First of all, I have to say that uh, uh, the group was uh, very active in the sense that many people contributed with a, a short presentation in order to present what are the concrete experience uh, with the topic and mainly the difficulties that uh, are currently in the area. And uh, so it was clear that uh, heterogeneity comes from the fact that we have uh, different uh, sources, evidence streams. Uh, so we have in vivo, in vitro, epidemiological studies. Uh, we had to use different species, uh, different study designs. We can use uh, one chemical to derive information on another one. We have different timing, short-term, long-term effects, and different study validity. And it is clear that one fundamental issue is the lack of data on uh, humans, uh, but also the fact that uh, at the end uh, what we concluded that uh, there is no evidence that is perfectly relevant, valid, uh, so in a way there is always the need uh, to have some sort of combination of different uh, type of evidence. And uh, someone also mentioned the fact that uh, there are some data on humans, but those are uh, difficult uh, to access. For example, the occupational data was mentioned, but the uh, comments uh, were made also on the fact that uh, although this data exists, uh, 
the doses, the level of the exposure could be not so high anyhow to allow for, uh, uh, I mean, would require anyhow some uh, sort of uh, consideration about uh, whether indeed this exposure is relevant enough to assess uh, the hazard. Um, and a lot of discussion focused on the issue on, of extrapolation on which uh, Donald uh, uh, commented also later on. And uh, we discussed about the importance of uh, optimizing study designs in order to get data uh, information that's uh, uh, relevant and valid. And then there was a couple of suggestions, but really for the purpose of the report uh, to this, uh, for this workshop that were to, to uh, in introduce in the report also some definition and co concepts, uh, because uh, in the group uh, there were a mix of uh, toxicologists, uh, some statisticians, uh, and we had the feeling that a mutual understanding sometimes uh, uh, can be difficult, uh, so it is important to clarify main concepts in the two areas, uh, also in the report, uh, and also it would be very good uh, to include uh, practical uh, examples that actually we missed uh, in this uh, uh, discussion group, uh, uh, really a quantitative method that could be used in the future. And maybe on this, I, I can give the floor back to <laughs> Donald. So this is a, uh, a list of, of, of the points that I thought uh, I have some experience in, uh, which I th thought, uh, at least from what I heard, uh, could be useful in, in uh, toxicology and, and in uh, the regulatory environment. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that they are useful, but, it, but they're just the, for, for topics that it didn't seem there was much familiarity with and they could be useful. Uh, one suggestion which I made also in the, in the presentation that I gave uh, yesterday was often it's, it's useful to formalize uh, decision function, loss functions, uh, to formalize ideas like, so a, uh, an animal loses its life in an experiment. How important is that relative to human using, losing its, its life? Uh, I mean, so it's, maybe it sounds odd, but if, if there are regulations on how many animals you can sacrifice, it, it is sort of relevant, I think. And like, what, what, what's the cost of a human life? Uh, and often that, that helps to do, and I pointed out that there's a whole field of, of, of statistics really called Bayesian decision theory. The Bayesian is, is not really that relevant, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's become a very uh, popular term to use, mostly by people who don't know what it means. Uh, so I put it in here because it's, it's been around for, this is from, from the 1950s. There's a formal structure for decision theories, how you should make decisions based on evidence, based on the, the, the costs or benefits of making the one decision one way or another, uh, and and it all, it often helps to be formal about about things because you find points of disagreement, and you often can find points of agreement that weren't obvious without before you're trying to be be formal. So just pointing that, that is, there is a field that's out there called Bayesian de decision theory that, that it appeared to me very few uh, toxicologists should know about, or or do know about, or, or use it when, when making decisions, and it could be useful. Uh, another point. That it has to do with the word weighing or weighting. Um, it's used all the time to talk about how you weight this piece of evidence versus that piece of evidence. And almost always what we have in the back of our minds when using the, the terms weighting is each study or each piece of evidence has a weight to it, and these are percentages that add up to 100%. And my point here is that that's not really what we do. It's not really what we're trying to do. Because we, if, you, if you use those weights that add up to 100%, you can never get out of the range of answers that you have. So if you're weighting something 0.1, 0.2, 0.5, you know, add up to 100%, you're always in what's called the convex combination of those things. So you're, you're in the interior of those answers. 
Well, I think what, what all of us are trying to do here, Matt, of, of you, I should say, not me, you're trying to extrapolate from animal studies and, and, and fallible studies to human, the answer with humans in the perfect study. Well, why should a, a human be interior to rats and dogs and pigs? Presumably they're at the other end, maybe not. Uh, but, but I think usually you have to at least open the possibility to answers that are beyond the interior of the studies you've looked at. And that involves this idea of building response surfaces, which is an old idea in statistics going back for at least 70 or 80 years. And, I, and, I, and it involves this idea of extrapolating beyond the, this, the current range of studies you have to outside. And just some, some terminology there that if you ever see may, could, could be useful to you. It's, uh, it's called, like the, if you look at all the studies that are there and you have all these factors that describe the studies and you plot them in some big space, the, the, the space of studies inside to which you could get the answer by waiting is sort of called the convex hull. Think of these points in a space and you draw lines around the outside, make it convex so it's a smooth figure and the answers that you can get by wait, waiting things are in the interior. And I think that's not what you're trying to do often. I think often you're trying to go outside the studies that you have and, and extrapolate to uh, humans or to humans of different ages than, than, than you've done the studies. And it's, uh, it's a, so when you use waiting, you have to be careful about it because over and over again, when, when I heard it used over these last day and a half, I heard it used in the, in the, in the context of they should weigh, weigh up to 100%. And that's, that's wrong. I think it's wrong. In general, it's wrong. May, it may be correct in, in some, some situations, but be careful because I think if you do use it um, and with, uh, in common terminology, that's what people are going to think, that you're getting answers interior to the, to the spaces, and that's, and that's not necessarily the, the, the right thing to do. Um, another point was that I think the, that even in animal studies, in vitro, in vivo studies, you, you, ha you have to think about how I should design experiments. Well, you can design experiments. Uh, and there are many situations where you have many factors, many factors, each one, for example, high or low. And I've worked on studies, I think I mentioned this, I don't remember mentioned in the, in the context of, of these uh, smaller meetings or the, or the bigger session, where uh, we're trying to con convert stem cells to uh, uh, beta cells for uh, uh, pancreatic beta cells uh, to, to treat childhood uh, diabetes, type 1 di diabetes. And there, we, we understand basically that there are 10 stages that take, take place, but at each stage, it, the stem cells convert to beta cells slowly. It takes 10, 10 stages of, of conversion, and there are many different things that you can do at each, at each stage temperatures, different chemicals you can put in. So you have these wells where you have what was it, 1,024 wells where you put different chemicals in and then different, different trays of these, of these wells, you, you heat at different temperatures and at the end you have to worry about, you have to try to measure how many of, of the stem cells can convert it to, um, to beta cells. So you have maybe 10, 20 factors, individual factors that you can alter. And, you tr and then you try to do an experiment. What's the optimal conditions at these different stages to, to, to help to try to encourage these stem cells to convert to beta cells? Well, if you have 20 factors, each at two levels, high, high or low, high or low temperature, high or low chemicals of this kind, that, that's a million. It's over a million cells. That, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of cells. And it's physically impossible to do that. So, but if I want to understand which of these combinations really works to con do the conversions, that's what I have to consider. Well, do I have to consider all million combinations in order to learn a lot? No, I don't. And there's a whole field of experimental design that's been around since the 1930s, you know, almost a century, called not only factorial experiments, many factors. So these factors with two levels each and 20 factors, be a two to the 20th design. There's each factor is at two levels, 20, 20 different factors. Uh, guys like uh, Fisher, Yates, uh, Cox, George Box. I mean, there are lots of, there are lots of names and lots of very smart guys 
they didn't do toxicology only, but they did lots of experiments. And they did experiments in, in industry and, and biology. Another area for this where I've worked on is 3D printing, where there are lots of different adjustments to make, because as the scanner goes over the three dimensions, it, they're, they're, it has different accuracy. So you have to use elliptical coordinates to, to, get, to get reasonable re results. But there are designs that you don't have to look at all million combinations. There are subspaces where you can, where you can look, so you don't, and they're called fractional replications. The idea is you have the, a factorial design that's, that has a million cells, and you take a, a, like a half replication would be half a million cells. A quarter rep would be a quarter million cells. But you can't just randomly choose them to get, get good answers. You have to select the, the levels of these factors very carefully. Or maybe the 16th rep. So you can, you can look at certain combinations and you can get lots of answers about the main effects, interactions, up to four-way interactions from a fraction of, of, of the experiments. Terms like aliasing and, con and the original use of confounding comes from these designs, not the way it's used in observational studies or in epidemiology now. They sort of stole that phrase from, from 50 year old or 80-year-old jargon in experimental design. Um, where we try to disambiguate things by, by choosing the combination of factors very carefully. There's a, a lot of interest in, in math, mathematicians who do this stuff because it, it, it relates uh, closely to the idea of, of, of prime numbers. For those of you who knew, know any number theory from when you were kids, you know, primes are two, you know, two three, five, seven, and so forth. So why, why is that relevant? Because a, a factor with six levels, maybe six levels of temperature. How do you, how do you analyze that? Well, six is two times three. So you analyze it as a two times three factor and break it into these factorial com components. So it, there's, there's a lot of beautiful, uh, elegant mathematics behind it, but also more important is there are a tremendous number of applications that are used all the time in industry. Uh, in, in, at least in, in, in the U.S. they're used all the time in, in the development of these uh, 3D printers, for, for, for example, in the development of cars. Or look at your, your laptops. Everyone's got a laptop. How many factors were designed to use to design the laptop? Do you think they did an experiment, the pressure in this key, high, low, and then we'll do another experiment with everything else fixed? You'd never get there. It's obvious you'd never get there. And there are these great quotes from, from the, 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 the guys who in, invented this stuff, R.A. Fisher saying, uh, a common misconception is that nature will reveal her secrets most rapidly if you change things one at a time. No, he said, that's completely wrong. Nature will re reveal her secrets most rapidly if you change many things at the same time, but in an organized way. So why is this potentially relevant? Well, if you do all these experiments with animals where you can change things, then why aren't these things being, being, being used in, in in vitro and in vivo experiments? Is it just out of ignorance? Well, maybe so. Are they worthless for, you, for your field? I don't know. But, but these are ideas that I, I think are potentially relevant, and therefore maybe you should be exposed to them. If you want to discard them, say, no, it's a can't rel I can't do it because I can't do it in my context, or there are too many companies working, or there's too much competition, or in the regulatory environment, I can't do it. Okay, because I, I, I don't know anything about that environment. But I do know that there's other ideas that seem to me to be very important in statistics that just aren't, don't, don't appear to be used uh, in, in, in your field, or at least I haven't heard about them. Um, and of course, this, this relates to the idea of species uh, and, and uh, you know, these factors can have different levels of, of E. For example, if you're doing an industrial experiment where one of the factors is the temperature of ovens, and you're raising and lowering the temperature of the ovens. And another factor is how, how you, um, when you're doing annealing, how you cool the product after you heat it. It takes a long time to change the temperature of ovens. So some factors aren't as easily changeable as other factors. And that's what experimental design is, is about. It's not a purely theoretical field. It's about dealing with practical complications. So maybe your experiments can be done in, in, in these more innovative ways. And maybe they have special problems, or maybe they don't. But I think it's, it's something that's, that's probably worth uh, con considering. Uh, 
Another feature that I sort of mentioned is that there's a lot of stuff with, with human studies that almost always uh, have to be done with observational studies, you know, not with randomized experiments. You can't do the same kind of randomized experiments with people that you can with, with, with animals. Well, there are lots of Im improvements in the design and, and, and uh, analysis of observational studies. And most of them don't, don't use modern computing at all. And, and I, uh, it's a rapidly developing field, but I think only, only some of it, well, I think very, very limited uh, uh, applications of it have, have been actually used in, in, the, in the kind of studies that, that uh, I've, I've seen talk, uh, discussed here. I think that the uh, uh, bias adjustment ba is, is a base, I mean, there's special cases. I think they're, in, in, in a lot of ways, they're, they're relatively minor uh, uh, bias cases. Uh, the very minor kind of adjustments on, on bigger ideas. And these, uh, I think the design and analysis of observational studies is, is, is a uh, rapidly developing area that should take full advantage of, of modern computing. We can do things now with computing, not only in the computational aspects, but in the display aspects to you, you using the, the magnificent displays, the magnificent storage devices we, uh, that we now have to do sensitivity analyses stuff. Again, these are, this is just uh, options that it seemed to me that uh, uh, weren't widely recognized in, in the areas in, in which you guys work. So because I don't know anything about the area really, I'm not a toxicologist by any means, uh, that, that this is, these are just possibilities that, 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 that could be useful. And they're, they're not really recommendations, but there may be recommendations to think about using. Because it, 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 there, there are lots of options that are, that are created, and they and they're not the options are not created right now at least very much from medicine except maybe in this the stem cell ideas where you're doing bi basic biology. But I think lots of, lots of the studies you do are like that. You can vary lots of factors, you have lots of animals, and you and, and you can do stuff like like this where you vary lots of factors. And the analogies are primarily from industrial experimentation. Where it's been, uh, where these ideas have been used since what? Post-war, you know, 1948 or something like that. They're, they've been used sin since then. I think I made this comment yesterday, and and in, in fact, they they were these ideas were, were used uh, to uh, rebuild the Japanese industry because they were they were they were so destroyed after the Second World War, and they and since 1951. Japan is given a medal called the Deming Medal. Deming was a U.S. Uh, statistician consultant who consulted in New York and, and for many uh, industries. Because these are these are good ideas if you have the opportunity to actually do do experimentation. Um, so again, so these are just my ideas that we just, they were discussed a little bit at the at the session because I, I I felt like I didn't really have anything else that I could contribute usefully. I I I, I tried to con contribute the these ideas. So that's what I have to say. Uh, Laura, you, uh, do you want to say anything else now or should you open up to, to comments? Maybe others in the group would like to add something. Well, first of all, uh, Don is new in his field. I, I'm a little bit as well. I suppose. So I, I recognize some of his uh, um, eyebrows or, or interesting interventions. Um, but I think it was a little bit confusing for most of the, the, the members of the group what exactly we, we were supposed to do. So we had indeed uh, prepared for for, um, for presentations, but only I think this morning we really came to the to the idea of, of to, to the better understanding of what what, what was needed. And um, I think some of the ideas that Don presents here, um, not all, but some have been used already in other fields, in, 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 in industrial chemicals, for example. We used the wording or the acronyms ITS this morning, uh, which is either intelligent testing strategies or integrated testing strategies. In the US and OECD, there is another acronym which I didn't use this morning, which is called IATA, uh, which perhaps better explains it. It's, it's called integrated approaching approaches to testing and assessment. And there are examples wh wh which you can use. So it's also, I think, a, a, an invitation to, 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 to EFSA to perhaps um, 
outreach to, to ECHA and, and the JSC to, com to combine the, the, their strengths and, and knowledge on, 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 on experience on this to, to also put that in the hands of the food safety um, assessors. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very good comment. Actually, I think there is a, uh, there could be a strength in uh, between the, uh, in developing re uh, stronger relationships and perhaps funding strategies between different agencies and also geographic regions, right? If you also include the U.S. Uh, the U.S. institutions, because we are sort of the funding streams are very different for science, and that sort of creates our difficulties in communicating the vocabulary, the terms, the definitions even the term validation and other some, some, of the, some of the things that we are doing every day, that they have different meaning, so. Please. I just, I would react to uh, those points that Don has raised. Uh, let me start with the first one. The Bayesian approaches are actually gaining more access into biology and risk assessment. So it is not, you know, something that we need to start thinking about. It is already there. Of course, we'll need to get used to it, but it has to be more applied. Second, I'll, I'll bring up my three points and then, you know, I, I, I'll see what the reaction is. When you talk about weighing and then, um, uh, should I say, uh, think that, you know, what we are doing when we weigh evidence is to assign weights and expect it to be 100%, that's not really absolutely correct because there is a difference between weighting and weighing. And when we weigh the evidence, we see how much it affects our final outcome. It's oftentimes really not even calculated. I know you know the group was tasked with looking at the, um, uh, should I say, called the quantitative approaches, but I think actually the group went out of or beyond that task. Third and last, the issue, you know, I really am a little bit puzzled because I think we moved from comparing apples and oranges to comparing <coughs> apples and rocks. Because, again, I think actually industrial development is one thing, and looking at effects in, in, in a biological body like that of humans and others is a different. Uh, for example, I mean, when you talk about the stem cells and the fact that you change certain factors at the time, and of course, I mean, we know even to uh, go back and develop, you know, uh, should I say, omnipotent cells, there are also steps that you have to undertake. But that's different because what we're trying to do is mimic biology. But if you have an intact organ, the biology is all there. So, you see, I think actually the, uh, there are other challenges to study design than, you know, looking at, 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 at changing the number of factors at the same time or following certain steps. It's, it's a little bit, you know, good food for thought, but it's really we have to take it with a grain of salt and think that it's, what we're doing is little, a little bit different in total. So it requires you know, a, a mutual understanding. Like Laura said at the beginning, it's really a matter of interaction from all types of, uh, all parts of science. I'm not exactly sure why, why it is different. You have inputs that, that you can alter, there are in, inputs that you can't alter, and you want to know the science. You want to understand how the, out, the outputs change with, with the inputs. That's the big picture sort of mathematics, and you're saying it's different. Uh, well, I don't know. Is mathematics really different for plants and animals than it is for rocks and, and geology? I, mean, I think we, we, we tend to, at least I tend, tend to believe that un underlying all these things, we can get a, approximations, and the approximations are going to be based on math mathematical modeling, and all approximations are wrong. We know that. Uh, this goes back to guys, you know, but let's go back for thousands of years that we, we know all, all, all mathematical approximations are wrong, but many of them are useful. And I think that th that way of thinking about, about things that I have inputs and I have outputs, and some of the inputs I, I can manipulate, some of them I can't, and I want to understand what happens when I change the manipulable inputs and what happens to the outputs. Is that different when you're thinking about the outputs being length of life or rashes from a chemical or something? I don't, I don't really think so. Certainly the details change, but I, I think fundamentally that way of thinking is, is called science. I would argue that, uh, uh, I would argue that 
yes, there's input and output, and essentially this this could be all down to an equation. But in, in biology, I would argue that the equation is much more complex and has many more variables it's, it's, than, well, than it's with probably, rocks. It's probably equally complex, if not more complex, in social science and in law, where, where there are experiments that people have done it, and you try to learn what, what you, and you manipulate to get outputs. Certainly, there, there, there are levels of complexity, and I, and I agree with that. Do I know which is more complex in fields that I haven't looked at? No. So it, it could be that the things that you study are so much more complex than the things that I've been involved in, but I don't know. Some of the things I've been involved in are, have lots of complexity to them, so I'm not sure. I'll yes, just, please. Sorry. Yeah, I'll just add one comment to that weighted um, uh, weighting that you, you spoke about. See, the problem I think most people in this room are familiar with is that meta-analysis and research synthesis traditionally has been a form of weighted averaging, where the weights add up to one. Yeah. And um, basically, that is what's used in the bulk of, of synthesis. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the group of studies and not extrapolating beyond the studies, but extrapolating from the studies themselves. So that, I think, is a fundamental disconnect in that's the discussion that, I, that, that that's happened. That's exactly the point I was making, though most people, I think, when they think about weighting, <laughs> it's going to be a series of weights that add up to one. And the idea that some of the weights are negative or some of the weights can be 5 or 10 or 25 to the studies, that doesn't sound right for, for the idea of weighting. And so I'm just pointing out that these, uh, building a response surface and extrapolating that response surface involves weighting weights that don't add up to one. Yeah, no, what I'm getting at is that it's, it's a very big jump to make. I mean, it, it, it requires an understanding of what the status quo is before we actually make that jump. Okay. What? Well, as I understand it, um, what we do is we interpolate for uh, some sort of point of departure that holds for the animals. <clears throat> and then as a separate step, we use an interspecies factor to extrapolate to humans. So in a risk assessment, <clears throat> this problem is approaching it in, in another way. So I think that is a fundamental difference. A fundamental difference between interpolation and extrapolation? No, no, what you are saying <clears throat> is you, when you, your weight factors add up to one, you stay within your domain. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the risk assessors are aware of, and therefore they use an extrapolation factor of 10 to extrapolate to humans. It's a very simple approach, I agree, but <coughs> it is intended to say, okay, this was only for animals. Now we want to have a uh, statement about you, uh, humans, and therefore we extrapolate by using a, fa using a factor of 10. And because humans are not equally sensitive, we use an additional factor of 10. So that problem is covered in a completely other way. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like it's covered in what sounds like a sort of not very scientific way, but... Yeah, no, no, that's so, if you want to make stuff up... <laughs> <laughs> there are additional approaches which, you, which call, are called database assessment factors, so they mm -hmm. use historical data or they use uh, database uh, distributions uh, and so on, so for probabilistic assessment. But it's covered in another way anyway. <laughs> Well, I think that the, uh, the attitude of uh, at least statisticians whom I know and, and respect, the idea is if you see a response surface, and the response surface seems to be very flat for factors that you can see, and you, like in animal studies, it doesn't change very much with the, with the species of, of the animal or the age of the animal or the environment of the animal, then you have ways of believing there's one kind of extrapolation that may be easy, Whereas if things are, are changing very nonlinearly with, with things that you can see, then you believe that's more difficult. And you're saying, it's the same problem, it's 100. Well, I don't know. It doesn't sound very, very logical to me. But, but it's your, again, it's your field, not mine. So what's illogical in my, <laughs> to, to my eyes may not be illogical to yours. OK. Thank you, Professor okay. Roon. Thank you. Uh, I mean, one of the challenging things in uh, risk assessment in general is that you work in multidisciplinary teams to come to an answer. And I almost felt that at, at work now, uh, 
hearing this discussion and trying to, uh, to see how different groups, because it's not my field and your field, there are more than two fields, uh, how do you try to understand each other. It's, it's uh, the, the most fascinating part of, doing, uh, of working in the risk assessment business, for sure. It's even more challenging than integrating uh, evidence. It's integrating the different people who are involved in the process. <laughs> And uh, to add to the confusion, uh, Mark Aerts will talk about <laughs> hazard characterization. I was also in this breakout group. I traveled a bit around. It was one of the most funny ones, I have to say. Well, so, Mark, can you bring this to the public, please? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, indeed, it, it is a, a, a challenge in a discussion group. It, so, multidisciplinary challenge group, a discussion group to, to have at least a yeah, an atmosphere in the group so that everybody feels comfortable and, yeah, participates in, in the discussion. And I, I had a positive feeling about it, so it was a pleasure to share, and I hope the group members also have a positive feeling about it. Uh, and I would like to thank all, all uh, group members for, for their contribution, and this morning we all together summarized it in the slides I, I will present now, so I hope I will be able to do a good job. And I also, at this point, want to thank the organizers for an excellent, perfectly organized meeting. Actually, I already received an email to fill in a survey about the colloquium. Uh, I had no time yet <laughs> to do so. <laughs> All right, so uh, how, how did we proceed? So uh, the participants of our discussion group received uh, a copy of the presentations and a list of questions we prepared. Uh, we is uh, Wout uh, and Matthew and Jose, Sebastian and myself on basis of the presentations. And I'm not going to walk you through these questions. Uh, that's not the purpose, but I'm trying to explain how we uh, yeah, prepared our discussion group. And then, uh, yeah, we went through that, those, those, those uh, questions in a kind of structured way, although at some point it went a uh, random way, <laughs> uh, which is okay. I mean, we had nice discussions, rich discussions, as said before, with different levels of intensity, and in some sense, that's fun. Now, well, I present this again like these three gr groups, these three main topics, and uh, not formulated as questions, but starting with how they emerged from the presentations. So we had yesterday three presentations and from all of these I think the presenter expressed the need for appropriate data. Um, little data is available and then often it's also aggregated but if we want to make progress to get further insights how to deal with multiple endpoints and studies, if you want to get further insights in hypotheses that were put on table like uncommon sensitivity, uh, if we want to get new insights, I mean not only those which are hypothesized or generate new hypotheses, it would be good to have uh, a data repository. So we came to how can we better share information between statisticians and toxicologists. And uh, from this need to have more appropriate data, it was the groups feeling that it would be really worthwhile to have a data repository um, as far as possible with all details and at the individual level. Detail on the endpoints, on the compound, on the units used to design, the original research questions, possibly also the questions which the yeah, researchers had in mind for further research related to the data, metadata. We would not exclude data sets which were not providing all these details, but as far as possible. And yeah, the, the idea was also that that would be nice to be complemented with a science forum, so a scientific, scientific forum where uh, there could be questions asked about the data, there could be a discussion about the data, and yeah, participants could point at similar type of, of data, so it could be a lively kind of uh, platform. The idea was also there 
that if people use these data from this repository that um, the output coming from this uh, research with these data could be uploaded, for instance, uh, so that we have in central, we have the data, but we have links to publications resulting, historical publication, but also new publications, so that you get uh, this kind of information right away. Um, of course, it's important to have the data in this data repository in a harmonized format, but that's easier said than done, yes? And uh, also looking ahead at uh, other types of data, uh, in vitro data, uh, genetic type of data, big data, uh, it's obvious that there is not like a unique uh, harmonized format, but that's the idea, that's the way to, to move on. There was also a concern from uh, one of the participants or more about it should be adequate. I mean, data collection or repository doesn't guarantee that it's sufficient, yes? Um, of course, there are property issues which might prevent that particular data sets or studies are involved or included. So there is a concern about uh, how sufficient is it for the purpose of the research that is conducted. Uh, that's in the direction of, of possible bias. So there, there should be like an, a body, an authority having the responsibility to, uh, yeah, be concerned about it and to look uh, about that. So we should be aware of the fact that it's, uh, we have to think about that. Also, it would be, of course, the idea to be uh, publicly available, but we are, there was also a concern about uh, misuse or ab abuse. So it should be ideally that people apply for it, that they identify it uh, themselves and they explain, like in an abstract, what they intend to do with such data uh, and that they agree, possibly by signing a kind of agree, agreement of confidentiality to uh, use the data as they intend to use it and that they also upload their scientific results. Now this is nothing, obviously we are aware of the fact that this is nothing special to our situation. This is like what we see and what we know that is generally in the scientific community uh, growing, uh, uh, yeah, a challenge and a, a, an opportunity and think people are more and more and journals and like European projects do require that uh, more and more the data are available, made available when the study is finished and so forth. Now, if you then think about how do we get further, we, we try to think in terms of points of action, uh, how to do this, by whom, yeah? That's, that's not straightforward. Uh, we can always look in the direction of EPSA or uh, other uh, authorities. Uh, we can, there are similar but not exactly the same existing initiatives like uh, eTOX or OpenTOX, like in pharmaceutical companies and consortium also agree to share data and so forth. So, I mean, it's a general awareness of the value of, of, of sharing and bringing together uh, information also, it was a concern, of course, if you start such an initiative at some point, uh, it starts with the current and future studies, but it is also very important to think about how to include historical studies. All right, I hope I'm a bit complete about this first discussion point. We spent quite some time to discuss this. Then we move on to the next one. And um, also here, it was yeah, from the presentations. Uh, I myself was uh, approaching my own presentation from the point of view, okay, there's an existing guidance from <coughs> EPA, from EFSA, uh, what does it provide about the yeah, analysis of multiple endpoints and multiple studies? Um, in vitro data, other type of data uh, came across uh, the discussion and the presentations. Uh, having different data sources and integration of these in model formulation uh, is ob obviously of high importance. And then the general feeling is, yeah, where, where to move to. So th these were the starting points to think about um, 
a community of knowledge where toxicological and statistical expertise uh, meets and is shared. And of course, again, it's mentioned here, more research is needed. Um, the fact that it's inevitable and it's okay, I mean, it's a good thing that probably there is a shift in proportionally in the amount of animal data to in vitro data and other type of data for several reasons, ethical, financial reasons, uh, urges us to think about probably, uh, yeah, more the me mechanistic type of models, the adverse outcome pathway type, uh, type of approaches becoming more prominent because the pure empirical models, uh, well, less as compared to mechanical models, allow you to in a particular structure or process to plug in, so to say, different sources of evidence and data. Um, before going to the, well, here also we, we looked at what's uh, already available. I mean, what, is there something like that? And I, I did, I think, a nice starting point, uh, and even more than that is the EFSA knowledge junction, which is freely accessible and I think user-friendly in its uh, way it's organized. Uh, so we, the idea is now, and this probably goes wrong, to click on this link. And I can only think that many of you are familiar with, uh, hey, it works. <laughs> uh, well, um, with the conjunction, uh, Knowledge conjunction, um, as you can probably not read, it's uh, presenting itself here as an open repository for the exchange of evidence and supporting materials used in food and feed safety risk assessments. Uh, and so, yeah, not going into any detail, but what you see here is how um, knowledge is shared. Um, you have like papers, reports, open access, the publication date, but you can easily, uh, of course, search like on BMD, benchmark those, and what you will find is not only reports, but also software, software code, uh, further stages, it could also be uh, protocols included, open access. So if you click on that, you will get um, this, where you will see that you find over there, you can download uh, software. Now, that's user-friendly and not user-friendly. Um, it's user-friendly how it's organized and how you can easily search things and find software. But then, of course, it's user-friendly for uh, our users to use that software, but not for non our users. And I understood that the philosophy at EFSA was if it's observed that many uh, visitors of that site uh, use particular packages often, and there is a need to uh, build an interface to um, have a more user-friendly way of doing analysis with that code, then they implement it. And that's here. The next risky business, how you see, Jose, your password is not there. <laughs> <laughs> but I have it. Whether it's working, that's something else. <laughs> Emanuali, no, no, joking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> one, one times more and then I give up. Hey, wait a minute, I think uh, it's open. Yeah, we p so stu st <laughs> stupid me. Uh, we we tried it out during the break, and <laughs> it's still open. Uh, but so this is the kind of shiny interface. Uh, not spending too much time, but just showing that this is a kind of thing you could consider as a uh, yeah the thing we want to think about sh sharing knowledge. And uh, so here you, you can upload your data. Uh, specify a subset with your response, what type of response, and you can go to fit models. Um, well, at least if, if you're not familiar with Windows, here you go. 
2002 one then, yeah, okay, here it is, show you set of models, whether you want a single model or a set of models. Uh, you can choose confidence levels and so forth. I'm not going into detail, but I'm just trying to say it, uh, it creates uh, possibilities, uh, user-friendly, and this is something you could consider, I think, as a community of knowledge where information and knowledge can be shared. Of course, here again, also integration of other type of data, in, in, in vitro data, in genetic type of data, data about thousands of compounds and the different data structures we have to think about the integration of that. And obviously also uh, uh, pointed out by one of our members, training should be uh, an essential part of such a community, an objective. Okay, again, hoping that I was a bit complete uh, in what I try to summarize. Then we came to the last third part, also from the presentation that's let's let in some sense more focused uh, and pointing at uh, Wout's presentation, uh, essentially they were kind of controversial in some sense, hypothesis about, uh, but he showed evidence, uh, equally sensitive endpoints um, across species, uh, no or minor interspecies differences, so I'm, I'm not going to into his presentation again, but we discussed that, and it's clear, I think, that, um, well, it, it would be quite having an impact if uh, the evidence would be confirmed and confirmed repeatedly, possibly not for all compounds and so forth, but it's, it seems to be worthwhile uh, that in case all uh, endpoints are equally sensitive across species and so forth, that would have quite some impact in the way to think about and also to uh, build models. Also, in case they are not exactly equal, the size of how much they differ is very important to uh, deal with and to think about how to uh, model data and those response model and bench model data is further. So I think that's uh, generally uh, the consensus that that's uh, worthwhile um, to spend much more time and to uh, further investigate that. There was also the important point made, hey, even if it's like confirmed or whatever, we, what we learn from it in future, we, we have to consider the implications for risk assessment. So we don't, we have to make sure to be convinced and to know what the impact is of uh, such, uh, um, let's say, yeah, conclusions of such uh, use later on. At some point, the discussion uh, became, as I said, more lively and uh, particular participants were really having some nice intensive discussion. Uh, I will not, no, not uh, mention any names, but they're here on the first row in front of me. <laughs> um, but there was also at that point a discussion because uh, well, most of this uh, about this uh, being sensitive has to be has, is applicable on the continuous type of data where, where you have to think about what, the, what does the level of severity mean. And so you have to think about the BMR and so forth. I'm not, again, I'm not going to, to the discussion, but I just want to mention that we had quite a discussion and some people as I said, had a bit more about it uh, and they're still discussing it. Not now, but I'm sure if the meeting is finished in a few minutes, they will start again. Uh, why not turn any, every continuous uh, endpoint into a uh, quantile one? By, uh, because it's about risk assessment, about the risk of events, the risk of an adverse event. So you could turn uh, continuous uh, respon uh, endpoints responses into binary one by using a threshold. Of course, the choice of threshold may be an issue. But if you have events, adverse events, and you have multiple of them, multiple endpoints, so this way the scale is clear, it's a, a probability scale, and it's, it seems, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not saying pro or con against one of the two approaches because that's a discussion. Uh, it seems that there are some advantages from that side. So on the other hand, on a continuous scale, you could look really on that scale to the size of an effect. So. There were pros and cons, so uh, we are not out of that, and especially these particular members of the group are not out of the issue, uh, but this was a, a nice discussion point. 
I think this is the last slide. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> we uh, open the floor for discussion, ideas, additions. Please, Matthias, and then. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Uh, concerning the first point uh, about the data repository, comes across like a wish list. Uh, so <laughs> yes. in that sense, we can add to it. Yeah, can yeah. we please have a pre-registration of those studies? Because only then we are able to judge what we see versus what is not chosen to be reported or summarized by the authors. Yes, yeah. I think uh, that's really of high value to to include and it's linking, let's say, the discussion group to other discussion groups, right? I don't know whether other members want to add something to what I said or in general or to this particular point, but I fully agree. Sort of a, this is Chris there, just sort of a follow up on that. It won't help with the individual animal data, but um, within uh, the EPA Irish program and also NTP on the literature analysis side, we are using sort of the same um, web-based platform to capture the information that we summarize from papers. Uh, and obviously includes sort of the risk of bias assessment. And so it's captured in a very granular way that we hope could be sort of immediately sort of downloadable for quantitative analysis, but that's mm -hmm. in, in part the intent to sort of facilitate this. Yeah, but the, yeah, I mean, the point is, and uh, I'm sure some of the members in the group can say more or have a more pronounced opinion about it, but a lot of data is available and uh, individual researchers do have data and there are ways to find data, but it's all scattered around, it's fragmented. So in that way, it's not, yeah, it's limited in offering a common, yeah, way to, to get access to data. And one of the interesting points I think I forgot to mention is, uh, as well as for this data repository as for uh, the, the, the knowledge community is that, actually it's over here, how to stimulate scientists to uh, be active. I mean, in two ways, uh, to upload and provide information and, and, and data and report, but and as well as taking from it. Because, yeah, if you organize such a thing and, yeah, people are not using it. So how to stimulate active use is, is, is an important point, I think, uh, to make it successful. Wout. Uh, sorry. Hi, yeah, sorry. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, also on the database. Uh, I've also a little bit of mixed uh, mixed feelings here. One is the harmonized format is, of course, the most beautiful thing that, that exists. And we also have examples, again, from industrial chemicals. We have IUCLID, where all over the world, IUCLID is being used mm. for registration of chemicals in a, in a uniform format, describing the toxicological studies in a uniform format. But it's not enough. And, and to design that for other regulatory fields will take some mm. years to, de to, to agree on a, a uniform format and to fill in and so on. So that's one of, the, one of the feelings. The other feeling is I use Google every day and they don't ask me to put my name and by and in, 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 in a ready format. I just plug in some words and I find lots of data. Mm. And mm. that's, I think, what you, yeah. what you mentioned too. Yeah. So. The combination of using algorithms to find the data that you need is maybe more challenging and more uh, useful. And the only thing that perhaps can then be added towards the generator of the data is to give them um, information, what exactly do they need to combine or to, 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 to add to, to this report or uh, post or whatever. So, for example, in the in the tax studies, it's important. Well, we have uh, uh, reporting obligations, but it's also important, perhaps, to add some more information on the chemical identity or those mm -hmm. or whatever. So you can feed your clients, so to speak, with better information what what you would need as a, as a, as a, as a risk assessor, mm -hmm. and then use 
the new fancy methods with, with all kinds of algorithms to dig up that information that you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's like an ideal kind of, yeah, world if such a data repository with all information you need and so forth would be available. But yeah, the general feeling was at least now, I mean, researchers do have their own connections and you can Google and you, there, there is a variety of ways to get to data sets. Uh, often uh, the details are missing uh, or you, it's hard to communicate. So the general idea was how to think about a better way. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, we came up with, the, with this, but is there, it, it's actually a question. Uh, it, it, perhaps there is no way or but is there a way to better, I think there is, but is there how and is there a way to better share information? Um, and that's, that's not only the data, but in this, in this part of the exercise and the discussion, it, the focus is on data. So the data is the central thing and you can, uh, with sufficient detail and you can link it to uh, the, 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 yeah, the work which has been done, whereas in the, uh, sharing knowledge more the scientific topics are in the core and yeah one of the members also noticed yeah how in which way is it different i mean it's overlapping or can you think about this being like one platform but i agree i mean this is like brainstorming in some sense and uh, thinking about and there's a lot of things out and depends on so many factors what you what you want and uh, what's provided anyway I don't know whether my colleagues uh, about you want to add something yeah I've got a, a couple of points uh, so first of all regarding the format um, I can say that we have a pretty good idea uh, how that format should look like we have used it for a couple of years already and we applied uh, that same <laughs> format for all sorts of uh, large data sets large databases are but uh, or collection of data sets for a variety of very distinct uh, research questions and uh, it works so it is pretty clear what the format uh, should look like for at least for um, in vivo and in vitro uh, those response data the other thing is that uh, it would be ideal to have individual data but it is not very crucial so we could also do a lot of things with summary data so if there is only summary data available they certainly are useful mm -hmm. to, in, to be included and uh, then a third point is that I would like to ask uh, at, uh, Christine if EPA is working on a database uh, would they be willing to share those data in a more Abs international Absolutely. Approach. So I was going to sort of follow up that I would love to see the structure because we want to sort of make sure that what we're doing is, uh, is on this path. I think in terms of actually pulling this off, you have to sort of think about interoperability between platforms and that's sort of where we're at, hmm. you know, uh, but our intent would be that when we do an analysis, this would be made as part of the analysis. And so it would be sort of very well curated, <laughs> including the bias assessment, but it would be downloadable as part of the analysis. So absolutely public. And the same thing again for NTP, and, and because it's a common platform, you can immediately think about sort of combining the power of the literature analysis done at NTP and, and EPA IRIS. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see sort of what, what the structure that you have to make sure that ours yep. is compatible with that. Yeah, okay, so that would be great. Uh, and then once we are uh, agree on the format of the data, data sets or the data sheets, uh, let's say, we also need to find out uh, how do we build up a database such that we can anyone can make queries and say I want this type of data uh, from this database and work that back. Yeah, and right now we use an application called Hawk which is free and open source and web-based, but it is more like you set up projects and you as the owner of that project have the ability to sort of make them private or public. So it doesn't have, so I think it's good to think about how do you make it really more as a repository that people can sort of query right. when people have chosen to make their public, okay. uh, projects public. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing we re uh, really need to think about. And, uh, well, I think that's the main points. Uh, well, sm well, small thing about chemical identity. Um, of course, it would be nice if you have uh, information on the chemical, but even if we don't e uh, know the name of the chemical, we are, we, uh, it would be sufficient to know that particular data sets relate to the same chemical, so that it could be a, a code, and that might be 
a reason for industry to say, okay, you can use our data as well, as long as we don't need to give mm. the name of the chemical. So that's something that we might consider as well. Okay. Any other members who want to add something? So there were also, uh, I was in the, in the, in the same in the same discussion group, so there was a um, there was also a suggestion that you could put models in there, so that it wasn't just the data for the to keep the data, which is also needed, I think, but also to so that statisticians could query that data, and mm. so eventually you would have this large large depository of primary data that uh, people could use, a statistician could use to build models. Yeah, th I mean, in that sense, um, I understand the, what the comment of one of the members saying, what's the difference between the two communities or, I mean, the knowledge community. I do see a difference in, uh, in sharing information. I mean, again, as I said, in, in this point, in this initiative, it would more be the data which are central. Of course, it could be linked also to, to models and, and the papers and so forth, whereas over here, it's more like the, the expertise at scientific topics. But if you look at the EFSA knowledge junction, you, you can also upload data there. Uh, it's also collecting data, I think, as far as I, I know. Um, and anyway, so this was, this was like a discussion which went in many directions, and um, I think this tries to summarize the way we, we, we were thinking in the end about what would be uh, needed, it would be re very welcome to, to make uh, uh, progress in, in the field of multiple endpoints and <coughs> multiple studies in general, but uh, in particular, but more also more general. Uh, if, if I can add, I mean, w one of the major <coughs> things that you, one of the most important things that, that you wrote down on another slide is how can we motivate people to share? Because uh, everybody is crying and, and, and shouting, we need to share, we need to share, but nobody shares themselves, and sharing starts with yourself completely. Uh, so, so <laughs> giving birth to the knowledge junction uh, a year and a half ago, uh, I mean, it's mainly we from EFSA who put in our things. Uh, we, we are asking people, mm -hmm. provide, please provide your models, provide your models, but I think there has been one or two uploaded from outside at this point. So, so Really, um, sharing is, is goes in all ways. <laughs> and if somebody has an answer on the question, so how to motivate people to share, please share it with us now. <laughs> it would be great. Or if, have some thoughts about this. Free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I can give my lunch even to yeah. <laughs> I think on the sharing part, most of the data is gotten from public funds. We need to start saying in the grant process, if you're going to be using these public funds, we expect the data to come to a repository and then have some sort of metadata from which to easily put that into a database. And we're talking about a database, it would be nice to have a program that could easily put it into a, the database versus what it seems to be everybody sending their Excel file or their, you know, MySQL table. And, you know, on another note, if we were able to do this, we could start talking about building that response surface that I think Dr. Rubin was talking about in terms of the extrapolation that's necessary. But unfortunately, now we don't necessarily have all the pieces together to do that. Well, absolutely, but I was more talking about the, the knowledge community oh. aspect on, on sharing oh. knowledge, sharing models, sharing ideas, sharing approaches. I, so I, I just found out about the knowledge <coughs> thing yesterday, and I'm more than willing to put my stuff up on. So I, I just found out about it yesterday. Uh, you'll have stuff from me within the next couple of months. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody has any addition to this or wants to add something to what Professor Ads was bringing to us? Or shall we move on? 
to the next speaker, which is uh, Danielle. Yes, uh, Daniel. Daniel uh, Wyckoff is uh, uh, at Talk Strategies. She uh, came to Talk Strategies after uh, doing her fellowship at uh, EPA. Um, and uh, Danielle uh, is working very closely with EBTC. She is a member of Scientific Advisory Council and actually was just uh, elected uh, to be a vice chair of the Scientific Advisory Council. Danielle, go ahead. Ah, thank you. Okay, well, recognizing that uh, I'm between you and the door, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, but also, I think that a lot of the take-home messages that I've been trying to collect are really reiterating what we've heard throughout the morning. Um, so, you know, reflecting a little bit on the, the organization of this, of this event and what we were kind of setting out to do, um, I've, I've, I've just pasted uh, uh, the text from the website on, on what the goal was, is really to provide an opportunity for exchange of opinions and scientific debate. And I think that what we saw is that we have a community that's very passionate about this topic and that we really have had a productive exercise in better defining the hurdles of our, you know, this combining of apples and oranges. So I think we're, we're moving down this path. We know we have a vision, we have some tools to get there, but we've still got some, a ways to go on putting everything together. <clears throat> so in terms of what the, between the presentations and the discussions, uh, the discussion groups and even just the networking sessions, I think some of the themes that I overheard was that really, you know, we're trying to pull together a number uh, and use evidence integration in a variety of applications. So whether it be hazard identification or characterization or risk assessment or weight of evidence, you know, a lot of these um, uh, daily practice or you know, events that we're doing every day in our jobs, uh, the, the systematic review and evidence integration is playing a role. And so we're all trying to apply it um, similarly and differently. Um, we're also working from lots of different established methods and frameworks. There's clearly a lot in the field of evidence-based medicine that we're trying to grow from, but we're also trying to integrate uh, aspects of causation and risk assessment and lots of quantitative tools such as benchmark dose, and so we're finding ways to put those together. Um, and as pretty much uh, we find with every scientific process, it's not black and white. And, I think that we're finding that both for the science or the biology of what we're looking at, the types of data we're looking at, the problems we're trying to solve, the conclusions we're trying to make, the science is, is hard as well as the process uh, in order to evaluate that, that <clears throat> data. But I think that we've all convinced ourselves that we really are craving uh, more guidance and more examples on how to better use all of the data. And I think what we've heard here is that evidence integration really gives us this platform to look at, to, to integrate evidence and to look at data more uh, in both qualitatively and quantitatively. <clears throat> I think one of the major outputs of this uh, exercise was also to really to explore future directions for evidence integration. And I think, uh, again, this is directly from the, the website as well. And I think the way that, that I'm looking at this standing here today is that we have, we have also convinced ourselves that uh, we, we have a common vision. We know we have a, a puzzle to build. Uh, we know the, 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 the structure of that puzzle. We, we, we've kind of started. We know the bounds of that. We know uh, where we want to go. But I think that we're still working on getting those pieces, what those, those inside pieces really look like. So that's kind of how I envision where we're at right now. Uh, we, we've heard this morning that there's certainly a need to standardize uh, our, our terminology. Um, I, uh, Dr. Ruman, I don't think you're alone in not knowing what grade is. I think, heard lots of people uh, in this event say, you know, I haven't, I haven't applied this or I haven't done a systematic review. Or this, so this was, you know, a lot, and many of these things were new to many of the participants. Uh, but one of the things I think that we're finding is that once we define what we're talking about, we're, we're, we're finding that we're talking about the same things. And I think that that really rang true when you think about some of the methods that we're trying to apply from evidence-based medicine practice. And so that's why I put learn up on this slide. I think that the more that we learn from what has already been established over the last several decades, we're finding that it is applicable. 
but I think that we're having to take the time to prove that to ourselves because we're used to using different terms and we're used to different processes and different data. But what we're finding is once we, once we take the time to really uh, investigate those methods, that they are applicable. Uh, but it certainly takes the exercise of approving it to yourself. Uh, we've also heard that uh, we really, we, we are at the opportunity where we just need to implement these strategies. Uh, we need to practice, 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 develop our, our, our data sets and our, and our uh, integrated sets and see what works and what doesn't. You know, and from that we can continue to develop expertise, uh, better train staff uh, and scientists to do this better. <clears throat> We've heard lots about communicating, sharing, whether that's specific uh, techniques or data. We've heard a lot about this need to continue conversations like this, whether it's in you know, scientific forums, further develop tools, um, you know, Hawk and Knowledge Base, and uh, th these, are good, uh, these are good avenues to pursue. And I think uh, we didn't talk a lot about this at this forum, but uh, coming into it, uh, as well as coming out of it, one of the things that uh, comes up is publication. You know, we want to encourage people to publish on your findings for, uh, you know, the, the, the techniques and the tools as well as the actual data themselves. Because I think as we, uh, as practitioners, are implementing these, I think sharing these learnings uh, what, with what works and what doesn't uh, is, is clearly very useful. And I think through this, we've also talked about the you know, need to, we, we've got some initial guidance and some structure to evidence integration, but there is certainly an opportunity to refine uh, and establish new guidance as we, as we go forward. <clears throat> I think uh, the, another observation that I had in, in terms of how we do this is that we certainly have a need to be very open-minded. Um, many of us are you know, we, we were trained to do risk assessment a certain way, or we were trained to think about weight of evidence in a certain way. And what we're, what we're doing now is we're essentially using a different platform to put some of that evidence together. And we're asked, being asked to think a little bit differently. And I think what we're finding is it's a little bit more comprehensive. It's, an, it's a more transparent uh, process. And I think that as we um, continue to learn about that uh, and adapt that, we can do a better job of harmonizing those processes. Uh, I think in doing this, we also have to recognize the need for flexibility. You know, we've talked about uh, food risk assessment, but we also need to think about, you know, we've talked about mechanisms and MOA and AOPs and, uh, you know, kind of different aspects of risk assessment that are important. And I think what we're going to see is that systematic review and evidence integration needs to be, uh, you know, we need to be flexible in adapting to many of those aspects of risk assessment. Uh, this will probably be, this will clearly be an iterative process, but I think that the more that we can encourage people to be transparent about what they've done, and again, what they've learned, uh, that will help us uh, to improve. And really, I think we also need to recognize that uh, the more we learn and try and do things, you get, you get better over time. So uh, I put this little graphic up here, you know, to, to represent, you know, don't, don't let the enemy be the, the perfect of the good. Don't, yeah, so... Uh, recognizing that we'll, you know, we might be taking baby steps, but we're gonna, we, we will get to a, a better place in the end, so um, to keep trying. Uh, so with that, you know, those are really my thoughts, but I think uh, it's important to get your thoughts in terms of, you know, the future direction and what do you think, because again, tying back to the objectives of this, of this event that we really want to gain from you, uh, we know what do you see as a future direction based on what we've discussed over the last day and a half. With that, I'll open it to the floor. Thank you for your uh, overview. Uh, what would you suggest to be the first baby step that we take? Mm -hmm. First baby step. Um, well, I think that for, for many of us, it's, it's truly just tr trying it, applying this to a data set, applying this in, in your day-to-day -day practice. So even if it's just a piece of it, um, if you've never done a risk of bias assessment or you've never tried to evaluate the, the consistency or you never tried to combine um, human and animal evidence, just you know, kind of pull out, pull out some of the materials from the workshop and see how would you think about it in the construct of what we talked about here. 
Yeah, some of it is, is really learning by, by doing, right? So, so we at, at EBTC, we have a couple of projects that started uh, a few years ago, actually. And, uh, and the reason that they're taking so long is because nobody has ever done it before. But in the process of learning, you actually, we started developing the methodologies and looking for tools that allow us to be transparent, objective, as, as much as we can, with all the flaws and with all the assumptions that we have to make. So, please. Thank you very much. I think we have one more message to take home. You see here, for example, I was in the working group where you were, and the question was, who of you know about GRADE or who does not know? Mm -hmm. So we have one message to take home. Please inform your colleagues that you mm -hmm. have been on such a colloquium, and please disseminate what we achieved on the colloquium, what we discussed on the colloquium. And also among uh, those, if uh, you were one of those like I who didn't know about the GRADE, mm -hmm. so I will be sure to ask my colleagues if they know, <laughs> and then I will explain them what it is. So it is, I think, also, and uh, one message to take home. We have to disseminate what we discussed today, and then I think uh, there will be some initiative to work further on those topics which we discussed, and I am positive that like uh, uh, in every group you try to uh, define what should be the next step that we will continue, some of our colleagues will continue. So it will not be lost, all, all the nice discussions and uh, group working, even if somebody said sometimes they were very intensive discussions, but it is good, <laughs> because when there is science, there are also intensive discussions. Thank you very much, and thank you that I could participate in this colloquium. Thank you. I think that's a that's a good that's a good point. Just very quickly echoing uh, this comment about dissemination, but also reiterating the participation. So forums such as this to continue to interact with colleagues and to continue to continue the discussion, but also grade working group or the working groups with EBTC. There are multiple. You know, e it's a good opportunity for training and to see how other people are thinking thinking about these topics. So. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, I think one of the, the baby steps that we took was uh, organizing and, and having this colloquium where we all sit together. I mean, uh, coming from our different uh, comfort zones, home, our different areas. Uh, we, 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 we sit here together, we, we, we shared. We didn't understand each other all the time, uh, but, but somehow, somehow, we were managing to, to, to put down some, some ki kind of ideas and a way forward. I'm uh, sure that, that EFSA, both EFSA and EBTC side will continue to, to work f further also together to, to, to go on, on this way, to, to proceed in uh, the big uh, challenge of evidence integration, and not only evidence integration. Um, I, I think this, this was really, uh, a, a big step forward already that, that we have had this colloquium and the opportunity to talk to, to, talk to each other and learn from each other on this side. Um, so just some statistics. We were also from 13 different countries in the EU, six different countries from outside the EU. Uh, we were with, uh, in total with uh, 82 people uh, from, in, uh, from international organizations, from, from uh, national organizations, a uh, lot from academy. Uh, people linked to EBTC, people linked to EFSA, so, so really it, it's, it was a heterogeneous pot, a melting pot, but we moved forwards. And we moved uh, forwards, and, and this is also, I mean, uh, yeah, first of all, we will, as an output of this colloquium, we will produce a report by the, uh, the report rapporteurs and the main rapporteurs of, the, of this event. Uh, you will receive this report uh, beginning of February, and then you have two weeks to provide comments and then it will be published and available online. Um, also, uh, to, to show your appreciation and enthusiasm, we already sent you a survey that you can fill in. Uh, to motivate you to fill in the survey, you will receive your uh, certificate of attendance after filling in the survey automatically. <laughs> automatically, 
and you receive your personalized certificate of attendance where you have to fill in your own name still, but for the rest you can print it, it's signed. Um, in terms of, uh, yes, presentations and the webcast, uh, so everything is uh, recorded, it was live online for millions of uh, followers, <laughs> I understood, <laughs> and my mother. It will all will be available online beginning next week, presentations. In case you don't want to share your presentation online, uh, please, but oh, we asked already and it, it's okay. So I think we, we come somehow to the end of this event. It's uh, ahead of time, but, but that's not a crime to, to be ahead of time for once. I would really uh, like to thank everybody who has been involved, <laughs> you all for coming for uh, attending, for, for uh, your enthusiasm, for your frustrations sometimes also maybe, but, but for everything, for, for really, for sharing. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the people from the technics, the technical people, the people in the front for the organization, the logistics, Vanessa there. I would like to thank